Good morning, this is Stuart Davidson here, your friendly bean counter. And today I wanted to talk to you about three ways in which you can maximise your profit on your property develop on your property development or your next project. And these three ways are the first way is to make sure you're choosing your site properly or your property that you're going to purchase. But I'm generally thinking about new build sites at the moment. So think about choosing your site properly. The second is design. Make sure you, you're, you're designing your property, particularly after the, the current COVID situation we've had and social distancing. Make sure you're thinking about your design in terms of your workflows, how many people, how can you restrict the number of people working on site at the same time through your design. And think about standardizing. So when you're thinking about your design for your property or your properties on, on, on the site, think about not just for this site, but think about your next site and your next site. Try and get a standard design that works and then rinse and repeat. So the third, the third thing is around keeping control of your supply chain. So I'll come on to that in a minute. But first and foremost, if you're going into property development or you're stepping up from doing buy to lets and you're ready, you've been quite successful in that and you kind of want to step up to the next level, I think the biggest change you're going to see is that <coughs> larger development sites take longer. A, they take longer to find and B, they take longer to procure. So you can get a little bit frustrated with that. And believe me, you can go through 60 or 70 sites. You can do an initial appraisal on 60, 70, even 100 sites before you find one that works. And that can get frustrating. You know, you can look at a site and you think, oh, this stacks up, this works. And then when you start to look at it in a little bit more detail, you find that it doesn't quite stack up. There's some logistical problems with the site. There's something uh, something around, there might be an option agree, uh, an option on uh, a lease agreement on the, on the site that uh, doesn't release for a while, or there might be some problems in the ground. For example, I'm looking at a site at the moment that looks, uh, it's a large site. And it looks uh, looks a potential. It's got no planning, but I think it might have planning potential later on. There's a slightly restricted access, but underneath there was mining. I mean, I know they're quite deep down, about 400 foot, but it used to be a mining site. So two issues might throw up there. One is that we might be required to do special testing. And I've done these before on over mining sites and the testing is really, really expensive. And if you find, because what you're looking for is fissures, fissures in the ground and you find them, then you've got to pump grout in there and you don't know how much that's going to cost because you keep pumping, pumping, pumping until none comes out again anymore. So, so something like that on the site, you might think uh, it's too difficult and you go on to the next one. But with this one, we're looking to do an option. Uh, you know, subject to planning. So, but but what we've got to be careful on is that if we are required to do those uh, additional works or additional surveys, that's going to be expensive. And it might be that we go, no, it's going to be too expensive and we'll move on to the next site. Um, another site that I was looking at recently uh, showed actually on the map. So when you, when you get a site and you look at a site, so you want to look at the land registry, you want to look at the flood risk. Is it on a flood risk plane? Is it in an area of natural beauty? Is it on a green belt? You know, all these little checks you can do. Then you run your numbers. What's the, what, what's the selling rate for properties in that area? What's the GDV? Then you're always going to put 25% profit, deduct that out, work out what your build costs are and all your on costs with your, with your seal payments, interest payments, uh, professional fees all of those if that if that doesn't and, and the cost of the land and, the, and and that will leave you a residual value for the cost of the land and you'll probably find in 75 80 percent of the cases that when you do your residual value calculation your residual value will come out to less than what they're asking for for the land but every now and again you might find one little gem and, and it kind of stacks up so yeah this other project i was doing it actually showed that it was in a flood risk flood zone on this particular site and um but i thought it was kind of on the borderline so i got i did i, I got somebody to do some more research on that and what we found was the flood the flood risk risk map was actually wrong so it's not in a flood zone so we're taking that one forward but a desktop top study will you know sometimes you need to put you know you're going to be investing a couple of hundred quid or a grand to get an initial survey done and that will make give you the decision as to whether to go ahead with it but be patient if you're stepping up to these larger 
projects because they do take a bit of time. I've got a couple that have been ongoing for two years, you know, but they're longer. Uh, <clears throat> and that involves site assembly as well. So I think the thing you'll notice, uh, but what in order in, in terms of your profit, you know, don't jump in on a on a on a on a site that's going to be too difficult, you know. Uh, make sure that you've got your profit secured. The first thing you take out on your on your calculation is your profit margin. And so take take that out, make sure that's ring fenced and secured. If there's anything dipping into that, then it might be that you just pass it by and go on to the next uh, project, you know? Um, you know, and so be patient, they take longer. But the good thing is when you're going through these analyses for each of the sites, yes, they do take a little bit of time. I've got them down to quite a fine art. I can look at a site very, very quickly and see whether it's worth pursuing in a bit more detail. So it's kind of a step process. First of all, you look at it in within five or 10 minutes, you'll know whether you want to look at it a bit more, and then you look at it a bit more, and then you will know whether you want to look at it a bit more. So you're kind of graduating how much time you spend on it. So, um, yeah, so, th so, but the, the good thing about it is every site is different. So if you're not buying a site, if you're not purchasing a site, you're learning. So I quite like I quite like looking at new projects and new sites, even if it's a high level uh, desktop, because you find that they've all got some little uh, idiosyncrasy about the site. There might be something with the services, the infrastructure, uh, the ecology, uh, the ownership. There might be a complicated leases around the site. You know, so if you're not purchasing, you're learning. So it's a good thing about property development. It does take longer, can be frustrating if you haven't found a site for a while, uh, but but it's a great learning curve. You know, if you're if you're looking into these sites. So in order to preserve your, or the first thing around maximising your profit on a on a development site is don't jump in too quick, don't be too hasty, don't offer too much for the land. Make sure you're doing your homework. You will go through 70 or 80 prop, uh, sites before you find one that works for you or builds up. So be patient. But the on the on the flip side of that, you, you know, it, you will be learning on each one. But to maximize your profit, you know, make sure you're purchasing wisely. So that's the first thing, purchase wisely. Don't overpay for the site. Don't underestimate the cost it's gonna to be to develop that site. Don't underestimate the construction costs, which I see done, done all, the, all the time. I would say 80% of property investors and developers over underestimate the cost of the build and particularly the infrastructure costs. So be careful about that. So maximising your site, the first stage is doing the appraisal and making sure you're not jumping in. And uh, you're, you, that, that's, the, that's probably the key area to maximise your profit is getting that initial appraisal, appraisal right and, and choosing the right site. So that's the, first, that's the first thing. So the next thing is when you're designing your project, when you're designing your properties on that site, let's say it's housing, make sure you're designing your house with your next project in mind. Because where you're going to make your profit is not on your first, where you're going to maximise your profit, it's not necessarily on your first project, it's going to be the one after that. Once you've got everything in place, you've got your design, what you want to do is you want to try and design something that works, you've got standard components that you can just call off. And that's how you, any manufacturing process, any, any manufacturer will tell you that, is that the first one is setting up your templates, setting up your systems, setting up your workflow, setting up your relationships with your suppliers and your supply chain. And the second one, well, you're, you're in mass production. So, so standardisation is the key. Um, you know, your architect might not be over thrilled with, with standardization, but you need an architect that is gonna be very interested in processes, systems, making sure that you've got components complied with building regs, but can be installed in such a way, now here's the key going forward this year, that you don't need many people on site. So there might be an element of modular. I'm not saying it's a full blown volumetric modular that you need to go to, but you can get systemized components see if you can design with systemated pods components uh, that kind of thing as well but it might be a modular but it can be traditional as well you know but as long as it's standardized and you systemized it you know we've got uh, for example a lot of people go modular and, and brick slips and and different types of cladding uh, we've got a, a system where we can do traditional brickwork very very quickly you know, but it's systemized in the way that it work, the work is systemized. Um, what you don't want to end up, because I know if you're, if you're kind of stepping up from your, your, your kind of 
you know, refurbishing buy to lets and that kind of thing. Uh, you know, you might have a small building team and you're managing that yourself, and you find that you know your builder began to and fro to Wilco's or B and Q's or what have you. Now that's very very inefficient. You know, that's just an example. It doesn't happen all the time. Some people are very organised, but it happens a lot. But that is fifty percent of and and fifty percent. Of, of the time spent on the job you know so when you're on a larger project you couldn't allow that to happen so you have to be a lot more organized a lot more structured and what i'm finding is that uh you know where you're you, you might be used to managing your own projects when you're on a larger project a larger development and you've got several developments you want to do you you've then got to delegate to a team to do that for you you know because you can't be in two places at once and if you're an entrepreneur and your main thing is, is is supporting the growth of housing economy and you've got a wider vision, you really don't want your head in meetings arguing with contractors or etc. Arguing with that, we hope we don't have arguments with contractors, but tradition, not in the way that we like to procure uh, uh, projects these days, but uh, but you can get into arguments with contractors and over different things, and you don't want that headache, to be honest. So you want a team around you that's going to uh, do that. So I would say, first thing to maximise your profit, choosing your site wisely. Second thing to maximise your profit is going to be standardisation, thinking about workflows, making sure that you can design something that doesn't need too many people on site but you're increasing your your productivity think about designing this project for the next uh, think about your design on this project uh, with the next project in mind because it's the next project uh, where you're going to make your maximum profit and then the third area where i would say you'd maximize your profit is to make sure you keep control of your supply chain keep control of your supply chain particularly when it comes to commercial and cash and make sure that's transparent. Um, because how, how other do you know whether the, your supply chain is pricing properly? You know, how do you know whether money's leaking out of your project? How do you know that you're paying the right price for stuff, you know? So from the raw materials, right the way through to your tier three, tier two, tier one, uh, if you've got a tier one contractor, make sure that you keep control of the supply chain financing and Traditional contracting makes it very difficult for you to do that. If you employ a contractor to manage the works for you and bring his own supply chain, he won't want you to uh, even talk to the suppliers. You know, I've known contractors that have a right paddy fit if you if you talk to a supplier and that, that's my supply chain, etc., etc. Well, that that all that's got to change. You've got to take control of the supply chain in terms of the financials and. Um, you know, you can, if you, if you still want a main contractor to bring a supply chain to your project, uh, then you, you could uh, offer him an incentive, you could offer him a fee for bringing the supply chain, you can offer him a fee for managing the works, you can offer him a fee for being principal contractor, offer him a fee for setting up the uh, site, etc. But if you want, if you're talking about maximising profit, you, you need to make sure you're in control of the supply chain from a, a procurement perspective, because otherwise um, you'll be paying 50% much more for your projects. Um, so that's a fact. One of the ways that we do it is a kind of quasi construction management route where we'll, we'll have a project manager or a, a site manager uh, managing the works, but we'll procure all of the supply, the suppliers, the supply chain, but the key thing about maximising your profit through the supply chain is ma in, and managing the works is sequencing and workflows so that things are, deli are ready, work, everything is uh, ready to place on order even before you put a spade in the ground. You know, because there's nothing worse than something not being available. The windows are late, classic one. The windows are going to be another two weeks or the windows don't fit or... Um, the electric, the, you know, the electrician and the, and the plumber are on site at different times and that sequencing hasn't worked. The first fix and second fix hasn't quite coordinated properly. All these things are going to delay your job and cost you money. So every time there's a delay on a job because the sequencing is not quite right, it can it can cost you money. If you're going a main contract route where you're only employed rather than managing and employing the, the suppliers and the subcontractors directly and you're going to a, you've said oh i want a main contract i don't you know i'll give it to a main contractor to do that's fine but how you how are you going to know they've priced it properly you'll go out to three main contractors 
you'll send out the drawings and specifications. How do you know they're using the right convention to measure it, the same convention to measure it? And how do you know the, the competence of the supply chain to, to manage and price jobs properly? I've seen jobs where I've had three tenders back and there's been a hundred grand difference between them. You know, I've seen projects where we've done our estimating and we're 50 grand less than the lowest one and uh, our price is the right is the right price you know and we've gone I, in fact I had a project where um, it was going out traditionally all the prices were above uh, way above uh, what the client's budget were was uh, but our estimate was under those you know and um, well it wasn't actually under we said you can get it we, we, we actually managed to get it done for 30 30 percent less than the contractors could because they'd paid a, they were paying a premium for employing a contractor and uh, that that's fine but you know if you're if you're asking a contractor to uh, to take control of everything you're going to pay a premium for that and that's fair enough you know but we our price was the right price you know um, the contractors saw more risk in the project we'd been involved in the project longer than they were. So we, we were more in tune with what the risks were on the project. And we actually bought that in 30% less than any of the contractors could have done by going a construction management route. So, so three things to maximize your profit there is the first is making sure you're choosing your site wisely don't jump in make sure you're doing your desk studies and be patient be prepared to go through 60 70 80 projects before you find one that works and stacks up for you the second one is think about your design and um, think about standardization and think about your next project when you're designing this project get the design right that works on this one make sure that you factor into your design not only standard components that are readily available but also workflows and that the design uh, you can have less people on site at the same time to complete the works on site to maximize so where you're going to maximize your profit is on your next project in terms of your de design and the third one is keep control of your supply chain and make sure that you've coordinated that supply chain that all those uh, components that you need the uh, the skills and expertise and site labour that you need are readily available for when you want them. So there's three, th three things there to maximise your profit on your uh, next property development. And uh, so I hope that was helpful. This is Stuart Davidson, your friendly bean counter, and I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.